Hello everyone and welcome to another video with me 320 Simpilot and today carrying on our series of tutorials on the Phoenix Simulations Airbus A320 for Microsoft Flight Simulator. We are going to show you how to run through the preparation of the aircraft for arrival, the entire descent, the approach and the landing. So a big video today, lots to cover. This will be primarily aimed at those of you brand new to the Airbus so this should be able to get you through with no pre prior experience just a little bit of basic knowledge of aeroplanes and you should be able to use this to get the Airbus safely on the ground in your simulator but of course uh, hopefully I'll be able to provide something to those of you more familiar with the Airbus with some extra context uh, using real world experience. I am a real world Airbus pilot but none of this is for any real world use it's just to give you that extra context on your home simulation. Now this is of course a highly detailed A320 that has only recently been released so it's very exciting and uh, we're going to run through lots and lots of different systems and how to get them set up for your approach, arrival and landing today. We are carrying on our sector from Brussels to London Heathrow, so a short flight, but we'll jump into the flight deck and I'll guide you through the setup. Okay, so here we are in the cruise, which is where we were left at the end of my previous videos. So. We are currently routing towards London. London is over here. We're going to land at London Heathrow. We're operating a uh, Brussels Airlines flight, a B-Line flight. So what I'm going to do is take you through uh, the setup and then the approach and landing. Now, you're going to want to get set up at a reasonable time before your top of descent. We don't have a top of descent arrow just yet, um, but uh, we're not far from London. London's probably 200 miles away. Uh, well, as per the rangering, actually, it's 160 miles away. So it's definitely time we get set up. This is even a little bit late, but it is a short flight. So what I want to do is first of all set up the MCDU or we're actually setting up the FMGC uh, via the MCDU, the Flight Management Guidance Computer. So to do that we need to go and check what sort of arrival we're going to fly. Now if you're using charts then that's great, you can go into your charts and start comparing them and select the ones you need for your arrival. But if you're not then don't panic, uh, I'll talk you through it. Um, it's not too difficult to do but what I'm going to do is uh, fly the Logan arrival so let's see if I can find it uh, where has it gone there it is Logan 2 hotel and then I'm going to plan we're landing on a westerly runway so I'm going to plan to land in on uh, runway 27 left so let's put 27 left in there uh, we're not going to worry about stuff on the ground for this video so a lot to cover today as I said so this is the arrival Logan arrival take us from Logan in towards the Lambourne VOR as you can see our flight plan ends at Logan because that's what we started with so to set up the MCDU in this case you'll remember in our full setup on the ground we did a diff strip acronym for the approach there's another little flow but it's slightly different it looks like a little top hat we go from flight plan to radnav to progress to perf to fuel prediction to secondary flight plan and that these are the only pages we need to set up for the arrival so it's a little top hat that we're going to do uh, some people call it frpp um, but that doesn't include fuel and secondary there's not considered as important but yeah you're going to do a little top hat pattern like this so starting with the flight plan you need to select the line select key here next to your destination if you scroll through the flight plan or something like that it's going to stay at the bottom anyway so it doesn't matter don't select any of these just select this bottom one here and then on the top right you're going to go to arrival now we need to know what approach we want to fly in today's video we are going to fly an ILS approach and we've already agreed and I've already forgotten uh, I think it was 27 left we said we would fly the approach for it is indeed 27 left so I'm going to select the ILS for 27 left then we need to choose the star so the star is the standard terminal arrival route so what this is going to be is our route to get us to the approach so as we can see this is the Logan to Lambourne this is our star chart uh, you can see Arnav Arrivals it's called, but uh, yeah, very commonly called Stars. So that is the one we're going to select. So to do that, you simply scroll through. So just like before when we set up for departure, you scroll with these arrows up and down to scroll through the different approaches available. So I want to find the Logan 2 Hotel. I've gone past it. There it is. And select. You'll see it's all in amber, and it appears in amber on the screen. That's because it is simply uh, showing us what it's going to do when we select active. Um, so... Logan to Hotel. And finally, there is the approach via and the transition. So this won't always be required. Don't worry if you're not sure what they are. But I can show you, for example, here, um, this is a straight line into, this is the ILS approach, and this is the star chart, but they don't quite connect. This leaves us at Lambourne. It doesn't lead us to the ILS. If we go back to all our charts, again, don't worry too much about this. Uh, I'm going to show you how to connect the dots if you need to. But if we scroll 
down is it on here maybe it's in the arrival chart there will be the transitions so initial approach from Lambourne that, yeah, that's what we're doing this time so I'll just start that and this gives us a route to get from Lambourne to the start of the ILS for 27 left so what I can do is put in the approach via because we're going via Lambourne so if you see it doesn't connect and we can also see that if we go to plan see here um, it it does just a straight line in actually uh, so it does connect but anyway more accurate would be to go via Lambourne and then it gives us the wiggly line that we're expecting so you might need to put in a via sometimes that via is used for flying full procedures as well it's it's not necessary to um, get too bogged down with it at this stage so anyway effectively you're looking to have your green line connected um, somewhat sensibly all the way through so if I scroll through now Logan there's the star and it goes all the way through and flies that wiggly line onto the ILS. I'm going to actually select constraint as well and I can see it has those constraints. So these are the speed limits the aircraft needs to obey when it's flying that uh, arrival uh, and altitude limits as well. So that all looks good. I'm pretty happy with that. If you have a discontinuity, which is very possible, let's say for example you, um, you're looking at a screen like... Uh, let's see what point can I take out without making a mess. Uh, let's take out Brasso. Um, yes, if you see this uh, discontinuity, like a message like that, this is flight plan discontinuity, all you have to do is press the clear button, and it's, it's yellow here because I haven't activated it, but if it did say discontinuity on your green flight plan, press clear, select next to it, and it will remove it and then join the lines, which uh, should um, hopefully help out. So if you found your star does not connect to your approach, that's something you can do. Anyway, I'm going to erase that, uh, and there we go. So let's go back to arc mode and zoom out and I can see now the aircraft knows our arrival plan it has a top of descent arrow just after Logan so that is good news it's getting pretty much ready that's not far away now so we need to to keep uh, progress here so there is the flight plan page done so we've got a route all the way to landing I'm also going to check here that it's a sensible approach so here's the runway 27 left there is the approach and I can also see the go around 1080 feet London 6 miles then 3000 feet so go rounds are for another day this is just to get you um, all set up for the approach so there we go so it has the arrival and I can see the three degree here for the three degree final approach to the runway which will be the ILS today next RADNAV so remember flight plan RADNAV progress per fuel secondary so in RADNAV again these will be auto-tuned you do not need to select anything in the VORs unless you're specifically flying a VOR approach which will be for another day um, but even then it should also tune the correct VOR but I'm going to leave VOR selected VOR1 is showing us pointing the needle to Lambourne over there but what I will do is go back to my chart and I'm going to check that the ILS for 27 left is coded correctly. So 109.5 is the frequency with a course of 269 degrees. So on the RADNAV page, 109.5, course 269 degrees, 3 degrees slope, which needs to match up with the slope on our chart, 3 degrees. This is typical for ILSs. If you don't have the charts, don't worry. This is taken from a database and it should be correct. Um, 99 times out of 100 it will be but we do check it of course in the real aircraft but if you don't have the charts don't worry if you've selected the approach and you click on radnav you should see the frequency in there we do not need to tune it ourselves which is great progress page now shows us uh, a lot of information but what i'm going to do is type into the um, uh, little box here i'm going to put the runway threshold that i'm landing on 27 left the reason i'm doing this is this gives me a good idea of how far away i am um, if I was to go in a straight line just in case air traffic control didn't make us fly around all of those squiggly lines we saw earlier maybe we'll go from here straight to the ILS so by putting that in there I always get a distance to the runway same for if the runway last minute changes uh, sorry not the runway the approach type changes or something like that it just gives me a distance to go without having to look on the flight plan page but this is a direct line to the runway which we're not doing this is the actual flying miles we're going to do 125 to go but this is more of an advanced thing but that's what i put into here on the progress page you don't need to do that performance page now is currently in climb phase which is wrong actually it should have gone into cruise let me just change that by putting 240 in here there we go uh, and now it's gone to Mac out cruise there we go so we are in the cruise phase that's the page you should see here it gives you the managed speeds and so on uh, you can see activate approach phase we do not want to do that yet uh, and it says enter destination data it gives you this message as you approach your top of descent the reason it's giving us that message is we haven't filled in all of the um, performance information so remember progress perf uh, so in the performance page you then need to go to next phase 
There's a descent and it shows you the planned Mach number and speed, which should be fine, assuming you have a sensible cost index. You don't need to fiddle with that. And next, here is the approach page of the performance. We need to enter some information. It wants the weather information for where we're going. It needs this so it can correctly calculate the vertical profile and also the pressurization. Because remember, it is automatically planning the pressurization. And depending on the temperature and the Q&H, which is the pressure setting, you may have uh, different pressurization requirements. Now, we can get the weather two ways in the Phoenix. We can go to ATS, MTDU menu, ATSU, AOC, which is the ACARS, remember, weather. And then I can type in, uh, sorry, go to weather request, type in your airport, and we're going to want the METAR, the current weather. So I'm going to press send. That will then arrive as a received message down here. Uh, it will take a second to arrive. Alternatively, in the Phoenix app, you've got the uh, My Flight section. You can click on weather. And you can click on um, the arrival weather, you've got departure and arrival, and then you can refresh it and it will bring up the weather. Or you can even get the Digi Atis uh, if that is available for your flight. But uh, we don't want to use the Digi Atis, I want to view the Metar for Heathrow. So um, there we go, it has now arrived in here, so several options here. More realistic would be to use the MCDU because we don't have internet in flight typically. So what have we got? Uh, QNH 1008, 16 degrees. So 1008 is the QNH. 16 degrees goes in here the ground temperature magnetic wind is 310 at 7 it's also got a varying wind but i would just put in the main wind the 310 at 7. flight level 60 and then we've got v approach that's all correct and filled in next is barrow so we are doing a normal cat 1 ils so if i go back to my chart i can get the minima that we're going to use as you can see down here barrow so it is not the height which is this little number in here you can see da is the big one and then in brackets is the H, the height. We want the dishes in altitude, which is above sea level. That's 277 feet above sea level is our altitude where we need to see the runway. So I'll just type in 277 into Barrow. Radio is for auto lands. We'll discuss it another time. Flat full for landing. You can also select config 3. I'm going to land config full today. Config 3 landings are for another video. And I'll just say that most common is config full on the A320 family. I know that the flap 3, <laughs> there'll be those of you out there screaming that flap 3 is in fact the standard setting. It is the standard flap setting and yet it is so much rarer for a lot of pilots. That's what I'm going to say from my experience. That's not necessarily gospel and that will vary between airlines and where you are in the world and typical procedures. But there we go. Flap full for my landing. Finally, next phase, the go around page in the engine out acceleration altitude. I'm going to put the go around altitude. So again, this will be talked about in a future video with go arounds. But initially, I have to stop at 2000 feet. So I'm going to put in this little box or this little section, the altitude at which I must stop in the event of a go around. But that's a whole other topic. So we've done flight plan, radnav, progress and performance. Next, we can just check the fuel prediction page to make sure we have enough fuel for when we get there. Um, I haven't got alternate fuel loaded, but anyway, we are arriving with plenty of extra fuel. Uh, and secondary flight plan, I'm going to copy the active. We're not going to use that today, so just a copy will be absolutely fine. So that is the uh, FMGC or MCDU loaded up for the arrival. Now what I'm going to do, because we're so close, I'm just going to press the pause so we're no longer moving through the air because I want to just talk through the next phase. So we've loaded up the aircraft for the arrival, we've checked the weather and we've looked at and briefed our approach effectively. Uh, we know the route, we know the frequency, we're going to fly a 3 degree ILS. I'm going to talk you through that as we get down there so don't, don't worry about that. So let's talk about our actual descent from here on out. On star routes, so standard terminal arrival, it is very common to have restrictions. As we can see here, if I zoom in on the plan page, just like on the departure, there are restrictions. These are shown in magenta on the navigation display. And as we scroll through, you'll see several. So at Sabre, it says flight level 160 on the navigation display. To check what these levels restrictions are, we can also select the key next to them. If you see a little amber asterisk, that means there is a restriction and the airplane thinks it will meet it. If it was amber sorry the magenta asterisk means it will meet it if it's amber it means it won't so these are all looking good the airplane is happy it can make these restrictions so see the t slash d point is our top of descent and then we have saber there's a restriction this green number on the right is the altitude it expects to be at or the flight level it expects to be at at that point if we select next to it i can see that the constraint is flight level 160 so the airplane wants to be at flight level 160 not above not below it is aiming for 160 um, and it thinks it's going to make it as we scroll through there's several more including speed constraints see this 220 knots and the flight level 70 constraint as we can see here these are drawn on and the airplane is happily thinking it's going to make it so that's what these are telling us um, just like they would on the departure so when we descend the aircraft we have two ways to, we have several ways to descend the aircraft but this 
down arrow is a calculated descent point where the aircraft thinks if it descends here it can follow these restrictions. So hopefully you've seen my videos. I have videos on climbing modes in the autopilot and using it for navigating. So hopefully you've seen that video. The descent is very similar. In, there are several ways to control the autopilot in the Airbus. But effectively there's two main principles. We have managed modes where the buttons are pushed away from us. So as long as you have your cockpit interaction system under accessibility set to legacy, you'll see these little arrows, which is what I have here. What you want to do for managed modes is to push these away from you with the little up arrow. So you can push all of these, don't ignore vertical speed for now, but you can push all of these up uh, and then you get the dashed lines and everything except the altitude where you get the little dot instead. What this is saying is telling the airplane to control what it's doing. So we've got the arrow telling the airplane, you decide the speed. So it just dashes out up here because I'm not selecting it. If I wanted to select it, I could use the down arrow to pull it towards me. So my point is, if you have these pushed away from you and you have these dashes and the airplane's flying along in these modes, Mac, Out, Cruise, Nav, then that is a good sign that the airplane has calculated its descent profile and it's going to um, follow the nav routing you've put in. FMA awareness, FMA means flight mode enunciator, that is these uh, words up here, these are crucial. So the green modes are telling us what the airplane is doing. The blue modes, which you can't see, are armed modes. There's nothing armed right now, so we'll see that in the descent. So I'm going to start this descent at the top of descent by doing a very simple thing. I'm going to wind in the new altitude I want in the window, and then I'm going to push in the altitude knob and let the airplane manage its own descent. One last thing to do then before we get down is you would, of course, do a arrival performance. So go to your arrival performance app. You would do a check of the landing distance required. So uh, we're landing at Heathrow. We've got to tell it the runway. I'm going to land on 27 left. Uh, I think the runway could be wet by the time we get there. So if it's wet, you need to select good. These lower ones are for future videos. This is to do with contaminated runways, snow, ice, slush, uh, flooded, things like that. So go for good if it's wet, dry otherwise. Then we're going to refresh the meter, get the latest weather at Heathrow and apply it. Then we're going to scroll down to aircraft config and I'm going to select low auto brake idle with no reverse thrust auto thrust on flat fall landing manual landing and i just need to enter my weight to get your landing weight take your gross weight now and take away the fuel you'll think it's going to burn before landing so how do you calculate that well we're going to land with 3.4 tons of fuel we currently have 3.8 tons of fuel so the airplane thinks it's going to burn around 400 kilos between now and landing now that's a bit optimistic in real life you'd probably burn a little bit more but there we go so if we took that 400 kilos uh, and we take it off the gross weight which is this is the live updated current weight of the aircraft so 400 kilos means we're landing at 60.0 tons so that's what i'm going to type in here so you do have to do a little bit of a calculation very simple all the maths that pilots do is simpler than you'd think <laughs> and there we go with those configuration it means that uh, our landing distance available is 3658 meters our landing distance required is 2000 meters so much shorter and the 1.15 is the factored landing distance so what you want is this 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 number on the right 2303 today must be lower than this number on the far left the landing distance available um, this is the actual distance required minimum but, but we don't want to use that we want a factor as well in case we float or something isn't quite right or we don't select reverse quick enough something like that and that, remember, is using flat fall, low water brake, idle reverse uh, on a wet runway. So there we go. Lots of room. Uh, brilliant piece of design, this. Again, better than a lot of the, uh, the real world app. So there we go. OK, so now let's release the simulator. And hopefully we are moving again. We are indeed. So let's. Uh, oh yeah, and I said low auto brake, so I'm going to select low auto brake up here. You cannot use maximum auto brake for landing, only low or medium. Uh, if you use medium, then I would recommend you uh, don't use um, flap three for landing. But uh, other than that, there's loads we could talk about with the brakes. But low or medium, basically, if your runway is short, medium. Um, but luckily, you've got this calculator here that will tell you. So you can see if I was to actually use medium auto brake instead, uh, let's change it to medium. It is such a short distance. So that's also an option but I'm going to go for low good so getting to our descent arrow what we need to do is select the altitude we want the aircraft to descend to so I'm going to put in Sabre at 160 as our first altitude I know that's the next restriction and then what I'm going to do before I reach the arrow is push it in um, oh, 16 and push it forwards uh, and by with the little up arrow I'm telling the airplane you descend me and you choose how 
and down it goes des now it's got this out magenta flight level 250 it shouldn't say that because we are below that restriction but that's going to clear anyway um, because of course we are below it so there it clears right so now we have flight level 160 blue um, you've got a little blue level off arrow let me just clear that ND behind us at the terrain display so there's a blue level off arrow at saber now we're seeing thrust idle this will change between thrust idle and speed depending on what the auto thrust is targeting we've got des mode which means the airplane is deciding and we've got nav we've got out blue 160 so remember this blue means it's armed altitude or flight level 160 and it's planning to level off there so that is all great this green donut here is telling us whether we are on the vertical profile or not if we are below it, i.e. if this green donut is up here somewhere, then we are low on the profile. If it's below us, then we are high on the profile. You can go to the progress page to get more information on this. VDEV is telling us we're 26 feet low, which is absolutely fine. Um, and it would tell us if we're above, it would say plus 2,000 if we were 2,000 feet above it. Likewise, you'd see this dot way low on here. What you see over here is because we have managed speed, remember it's pushed in, so we get the dashed lines, we're letting the airplane choose the speed, it's going to obey the speed restrictions for us, and it's going to target the speed in this bracket. That way if there's something different about the winds compared to what it was expecting, then it can keep at idle thrust and be more efficient without having to start changing thrust settings and so on. If it gets a bit high, it will accelerate up to this top limit. If it gets a bit low, it will decelerate, it will pull the nose up to this lower limit. There we go. Something I want to show you is if uh, we're flying this whole arrival in descent mode at the moment, so the managed mode. What I'm going to do is go back to the chart. I can just choose my arrival. Um, so the level restriction at the final point, 70 at Lambourne, we can see here the blue line above and below. So that's the limit. So I can actually just put 70 in the window now and it will show us uh, the next restriction it's going to have to apply, 160 in magenta here. So let's say a traffic control said, don't worry about those restrictions, just descend now as quickly as possible, please, flight level 70. How do we do that? Well, this brings me on to the selected modes for descent. If we pull the altitude, we get this, open descent. In open descent mode, the Airbus will command thrust idle, as it is, and you'll see thrust idle on the left here. And then it will descend and adjust the pitch to maintain the speed on the left. So that's what open descent is. Now, as you can see, the speed is still managed. So the airplane is just choosing to fly that planned descent speed, which was available on the perf page 277 knots is what it's flying. Uh, it was a Mach number higher up. So if I want to descend quicker, what I can do is also select the speed. So pull it with the little down arrow and then you see it goes blue because I've now selected it and then I can wind it up and up and up and the airplane well, it doesn't have any more thrust to apply because I've told it I want you in, in thrust idle open descent. So it's going to lower the nose to aim for that speed target. So that's how you could descend a bit quicker. And this will ignore the restrictions now. We're in open descent. Hence, 70 appears down here. Good. So let's go back to manage descent. And there's speed des. Uh, we've got out 70, which is not quite right. But uh, there we go. Alt 160. It should now level off at 160 for us. It will have to apply thrust to do that. And you can see the VDEV scale has gone way above us. So those are some of the modes. The final mode would be vertical speed. I can select a vertical speed by pulling it towards me, remember, once again taking control from the airplane, and then you can simply wind it carefully. Now watch out if you select the vertical speed above you by accident, just like in the climb, if you do it the wrong way, you will lose the out blue message, and therefore uh, you're never going to level off. It's just going to keep climbing at 400 feet per minute. And remember, in vertical speed, the airplane will prioritize that over your speed target. So if I now wind the vertical speed to something ridiculous, like let's do something stupid down. Let's do all the way there. 5,000 feet per minute down. Watch. So the airplane is in speed mode, targeting speed mode, but it is which means the auto, sorry, the auto thrust is targeting speed, but the vertical speed has taken priority. The engines are at idle, but it cannot slow down enough, and it will keep accelerating until it does get close to an overspeed. Now, the Airbus does have a protection in place, but just watch out. It will not prioritize the speed in this case. Um, it will just prioritize the vertical speed. It won't quite overspeed or, or stall because there is a, another protection, which we'll see in another video. Right, so managed, managed, there you go, uh, and it should level off. It's, there you go, it's going to aim down for the next restriction at Lambourne 70, Des. Next, uh, remember air traffic control might give you heading, so you could pull the heading and take control of it. Um, if you do, manage des mode will not work. You get this, it's reverted to vertical speed and you heard that triple click. That's because it cannot fly in manage descent mode in heading because it doesn't know where you are, so it can't calculate it as well. So in heading mode, all you can use is vertical speed or open descent. Those are your two options uh, and then you can fly around in heading. That would be a way to navigate your way to the, the runway or what air traffic control might do at busier airports. 
To go back into nav is to push it in and it should re-engage nav, but that's only if you're very close to the line or pointing towards the green line on the navigation display. If you are not, if you're pointing away, let's wind the airplane all the way to the left like this, 200 degrees and turn it away. Um, if you're pointing away, it will not automatically go back to the line. So you need to then do a direct. So let me just show you that. So we're turning away now. Let's put it into vertical speed for a while as we're so low. So I'm just going to do a thousand feet per minute. There we go. So we're pointing away now. By the way, on the nav display, you can see this number 0 0.6. It's telling us we are 0.7 miles now left L of the, the planned line here. So once you get off the line, you can't just go back into nav. I can push this and it will arm nav. Nav is in blue, remember that's armed. So it's saying, well, I'll do nav when I can, but it wants us to be on this line pointing at the waypoint brasso, which I can see up here. So it's never gonna do that because we're pointing away. So we'll just fly off into the infinite. It won't actually re-engage. So if you're pointing away, uh, and you're in this situation, you can either turn the heading mug back round to intercept that line, but that's not perfect, especially if the two waypoint, which is what this waypoint up here is, is now behind you. So the best way, the neatest way, and you can see here, by the way, no nav intercept message. It's telling us you're not going to intercept the navigation line. This won't work. It's very clever. It's warning us this isn't working. I recommend you do a direct. So go to the direct. We'll skip Brasso. Let's go direct to Wessel. You select it. You look on your screen. You'll see the amber line that it's computed. And then you can do direct to insert. And now the airplane will fly that line back. Now we are back in um, nav mode. I can re-engage DES, speed, DES, nav. And the airplane can take over again uh, and make my job a bit easier. So there we go. That is some of the modes for descending the Airbus. So the next thing happening is we're reaching 10,000 feet. Now, an important thing happens at 10,000 feet in the descent. There's a few things that we're going to do here, but uh, typically this is around the time where we will consider turning on the fasten seatbelt signs and the camera crew can start preparing the cabin for our arrival. You'll also see the aircraft will automatically decelerate to 250 knots on most arrivals. There's also a 250 knot point on the navigation display. This little magenta dot here is a decel point, by the way. So that means I can see that there's a the aircraft will change its speed and slow down. So actually, not only is there a 250 knot limit at Wessel, there's actually a 250 knot limit for flight level 100, which is quite normal. Speed limit exceeded message just means that it's probably gone through a few knots. Not a major concern. So 10,000 feet, we've turned on the seatbelt signs. Some airlines will turn on the landing light to this point uh, they used to be normal but these days um, sometimes they don't so landing lights can come on they'll fold out into the airflow make a little rumble under the wings and we can press the ls buttons remember we're flying an ILS today so we press ls on both sides that way that's going to show us our ILS scales landing scales landing system there's a few different arguments over what the actual name is and what ls stands for but there it is so that's now ready there's no magenta dots but i can also see the frequency that's tuned 1095 so there we go that is something we'll do at 10,000. Uh, also, if we were flying a non-precision approach, like a VOR or an RNAV, we wouldn't turn on the LS. It def definitely would not. But we're flying an ILS, so we do. And if you're doing a non-precision, but it's a good habit anyway, is to go to the progress page and just check that your navigation accuracy is good. So GPS is primary, tells me a good thing. But also I can see here, required accuracy 0 0.3, estimated 0 0.03. So this number on the right should be smaller than the number on the left. If it is, your accuracy will be high. The aircraft knows where it is to a good level of certainty, so we can carry on flying this approach as per normal. But that's again more applicable to non-precision style approaches. Now we couldn't arrive into Heathrow without planning to do a hold. So uh, what if you are asked to do a hold by air traffic control? I know uh, those of you going on to Vatsim with this will want to know how to do that. So very straightforward in the Airbus. Go to your flight plan page, then select the waypoint you want to hold at. In this case, Lambourne. And I can see that on the chart, Lambourne has a hold in it, uh, at it. I'm going to select next to it with the key and then select hold. Very straightforward. Hold at Lambourne, uh, we can have computed or we can have a database one, the database one isn't here, but computed is gonna be based off your current inbound. So let's do the correct hold. It's a left-hand turn hold. Inbound course is 263, outbound is 083. So course 263, and then I just changed the R to left for a left-hand turn, one minute time, that's fine for today, insert. Um, you can change the times depending on your altitude. Uh, up to flight level 140, it's one minute holds. Above flight level 140, it's one and a half minute holds. That time is the time of the outbound leg. Um, so a one minute hold is a bit smaller than a one and a half, but that's a, a detail. So now you can see the hold is in a green line in front of us. So the airplane is going to arrive at Lambourne. 
it's going to obey the speed constraint and it's going to enter this hold and on the flight plan page you can see Lambon hold left hold left hand turns so that is all looking good we have plenty of fuel you definitely want to take a note of your fuel if you think you'll end up in the hold I'm leaving it in des mode but remember there is also open descent uh, if I pull that it will go open descent down to flight level 70 now it's slowing down to come back to green dot speed which is the most efficient speed to sit in the hold at so coming back to green dot that is normal at this point in the approach so we'll fly a hold and I'll show you how to get out of the hold as well if air traffic control asks you to beautiful day out there today very nice right so speed and out star these modes won't change by the way it's going to stay in nav mode as it flies the hold so let's zoom right in and we'll see now reaching overhead green dot speed which is the again the most fuel efficient speed to be sitting in a hold at and now it's just going to fly around i'm sure many of you have spent plenty of time sitting in this hold in the, in the real world if you've ever flown into heathrow so we'll leave it there flying its hold um, if we wanted to leave all we do is press immediate exit it will then carry on around the hold but next time over landborn it will actually continue with the approach and carry on flying that line now before we do that i want to show you what's coming up because it's going to get busy again so i'm going to go to plan i'm going to scroll through the flight plan and we can see all these different waypoints so if you look at this it's going to obey the constraints you've got these little magenta dots where it's going to decelerate um, no problem there as expected but here's the one I want to show you you can just about make out here a magenta D it's a it says D and it's got a magenta ring and it's written in magenta maybe it's pretty clearer no no clearer um, that is the deceleration point so what's the significance of that point well what's going to happen is when the aircraft overflies that waypoint it's a pseudo waypoint which means the aircraft has generated it it is not from a database it is dynamic and the aircraft has chosen to put it there when we fly through that waypoint, and by the way, we can actually see it here, see that decel? Um, it's going to activate the approach phase. So what does that mean? Well, if you think back earlier, you'll remember on the performance page, we have this little option, activate approach phase, which we haven't done yet. We don't do that until a bit later on. What that does is when we activate it, it will change the target speed that the airplane is targeting when in managed speed mode, as it is now. So if we activate the approach phase, Right now, the airplane will target green dot speed. If we then put out flap 1, the airplane will automatically reduce the speed to target the S, S speed. Remember from takeoff that S speed is there, it's our minimum clean with the slat, or minimum speed of the slats out. It's not actually the minimum, but it's often used like that. Um, but anyway, so what we want to do is before we fly the approach, we must have the approach rates activated because that way we can have that activated. We can manage the speed on the FCU and just put the flaps out and the airplane will automatically target the next speed as you slow down. So when you go to flaps two, it will target the flap two F speed. Uh, and then when you put out flap full, all the way down to flap full, it will actually target your V approach. So once you're in landing configuration of flaps, whether that's three or full, it's full today the airplane will target the V approach speed. So it's very clever. So it means we don't have to sit here winding the speed back as long as it's in managed speed and the approach phase is activated. However, if you do it too early, it will mess up the descent planning a little bit. The Airbus will think that you're trying to slow down early and it will get a bit confused. But anyway, you have the option to do that. So we could activate it now. It'll be no problem. But I'm going to do it once I leave the hold because uh, that's, that's more of a normal way to do things. So hopefully that's clear. We can activate the approach phase in the MCDU using this button on the perf page. Uh, you can actually also see it in the um, uh, oh no don't do that you can see it goes amber there we go <laughs> so uh, yeah you can confirm it so anyway we can activate it here or we can fly through this magenta waypoint and it will do it itself however doing it like this can be a little bit late it's quite sporty if you just do it when the airbus automatically would do it so a lot of people most people will activate it themselves a bit earlier just so they have control and then if you want to fly faster than green dot or whatever speed it's targeting then you can actually just pull the speed but having it activated earlier is a good thing it's very important if it's not activated you could find and it could be by accident it's not activated or you've missed a waypoint or something it's unusual but it you know it could mean that you target the wrong speed without realizing but anyway there we go so currently in the hold what i'm going to do is go to uh, flight plan immediate exit and now you can see the hold line has disappeared it's going to carry on with the arrival great stuff now what's our next altitude we can fly down to if i go to the initial approach from lambourn there we go uh, it's actually going to go minimum holding level which is seven zero and then six thousand feet over here so you guessed it uh, what's coming up is we need to set our Q&H. We're not going to do that until we're cleared to an altitude. So our next cleared altitude is 6,000 feet. 
Um, let's say a traffic control tells us to go to 6,000 now and they tell us to do it immediately. Then I'll put 6,000 in the window, vertical speed down and pull, vertical speed 900, out blue, it's armed, 60, and now we can set the Q&H. Which we agreed was, I've already forgotten, I've written it in the perf page. Q&H is 1008. 1008 and we'll set it on the standby as well there we go so now it's going to level off at 6,000 feet which is great slightly below constraints since hence the magenta dot uh, sorry the uh, donut is now above us so leveling off at 6,000 so from here we could let the airplane fly around this and then we can uh, join the ILS like that uh, very straightforward we leave it in nav mode once we're on an intercept heading so somewhere here uh, I'm simply going to press approach that's all you need to do in the Airbus that will arm and you'll see in blue lock and glide slope sorry glide slope and lock um, but we don't want to do that just yet because I'm going to show you a different way of doing it. So very straightforward. If you're not sure, you can just leave it in nav until you arrive uh, on your intercept heading and go from there. So what I'm going to do now is just pause the sim once more because we've got a couple of things to talk about. It's going to happen very quickly. Okay, so the sim is paused. We're not moving. A second way, and a common way to fly approaches, is the air traffic control vectors you. So those of you using VATSIM, uh, you might get a heading, and then we intercept the ILS like that. By, so we just head over towards it. This is the final approach over here on our navigation display. If that were to happen, then we need to make sure that the flight plan is sequenced. So what do I mean by that? Well, the current two waypoint is written in white on the navigation display, and it'll also be, if you go to flight plan page, it would default to line two. So Lambourne 11D is the two waypoint. We can also see it up here on the top right of the navigation display, Lambourne 11. If I was to fly over here, we would miss that waypoint. And if we don't fly close enough, the Airbus wouldn't think we still want to go to it and it would get confused um, and it's not ideal. So I'm gonna show you how we can fix that. What you can do is you can actually extend this center line. You can get the airplane to draw the center line out. Now this is a bit advanced, so if you're not sure, don't worry too much about this. Um, just stick with the green line. But I'm gonna show you what I mean by that. So I'm just gonna unpause the sim. So let's say we're now given headings and they say continue present heading. So there we go, we're into heading mode. Going, we're level at 6,000. Uh, you can see it's lost the constraints now because we've come off that. So what I'm gonna do is activate the approach phase as we agreed earlier. Activate, and now target speed will drop back to green dots. There we go. So what I want to do now is extend this center line over here. So if you, this is a bit advanced, so don't worry too much, but if you go direct, pick a waypoint on the final approach. I'm gonna go for CI27 left, CI27 left. And then I'm gonna do a radial in, and I'm gonna put in the reciprocal. So the opposite direction, because I want the line to go this way. So I put 089 into the radial in, and it will draw a line at 089 into the CI27 left. Hence that yellow line there. And then I'm gonna insert it. So what we've done now is the two waypoint now is the CI27 left. Now you could also just clear through the other waypoints if you're not happy with this system. But what I've shown you there is now the two waypoint is CI27 left, so the calculation should be based on that and be a bit uh, better. And it means the flight plan is sequenced, so when we join the ILS, it will fly via these points and it will sequence to the next one. That way, when we come to fly a go-around, uh, it will have sequenced properly. It also is a good way of ensuring that the approach phase activates automatically in case you've forgotten. Now here's our favorite message, no nav intercept. That's not a problem. Um, that's because we're not pointing at that line we've just drawn. We get the nav blue up here. All you have to do is re-pull the heading bug to clear it out. Great. And now I'm going to turn the aircraft around and start heading over towards that line. And let's descend down to 3,000 feet. Uh, we'll do that in open descent. So thrust idle open descent, and we're descending to 3,000. So those of you who stuck with the green line, that's absolutely fine. And you can follow through from here just as you would have done. But this is the method that allows you to sequence the flight plan um, and like I say, alternatively, you could just clear through the waypoint. Lots of ways of doing it. But the idea is that this point up here should always be a point you are actually flying to, ideally, and not one that's behind you. That way, you'll remove a few possible errors the Airbus could throw up. Now, remember, we are at green dot because the airplane is um, in managed speed mode and I've activated the approach phase. If I go to perf, it's no longer an option because it is active. So let's select the flaps. Just going to pause it once more. Sim is paused. How do we select the flaps? Well, obviously we just move the flap lever, but we have some speed limits. We can't just do it at full speed. So what are those limits? Well, they're written up here. Velocity for flap extension, 1, 1 plus F, 2, 3, and full. In flight, if you select the flap lever to 1, you'll get just 1. 1 plus F means that you'll get 1, which is the slat, and then a bit of flap at the back. 2, 3, and full all include flap anyway. So the 1 plus F is used for takeoff, disregard it in flight, and it's only in some abnormal situations where you might see it. So 1 is a speed limit of 230 knots. That's helpfully shown by the Airbus on the PFD with these little amber equals lines up here. So, oh, they're called eyebrows. So 
Once we're below that amber, then I can select the uh, next stage of flap. So releasing the sim again, we are moving. I want to go flap one. So let's go flaps one. And now the red line, the overspeed limit drops to that limit and the speed starts reducing to the green S. Remember we agreed that with the approach phase active and in managed speed, as we put the flap out, it will target the next speed automatically. So there we go. Now, you can go below the S if you need to. So if I wanted to select speed, let's say air traffic said 170 knots, there's nothing to stop me selecting 170 here. That would be okay. You must not go below VLS. Uh, most pilots don't go too far below these speeds, but you know, it, it is acceptable, um, but with some caution. Let's just, I'm just gonna radar back to myself because I'm not using that green line as we saw earlier. So let me just head a little bit outbound. There we go. I'm just going to use my heading bug to get myself round onto the RS. So there you go, the speed now will actually target that. It's gone below the S. But if I manage it again and let the airplane decide, you'll see that the target is shown as 134, but it, would, it won't actually fly that target. That is the approach speed. It is going to return to the green S. That's what it's aiming for. I can also, of course, interfere with vertical speed and select a vertical speed. And then we'll see speed, vertical speed. Um, you know, these are all the different modes we've already seen. Remember, DES mode is no longer available to me because I'm not on my green line. I'm not in nav mode. There is London beneath us. Great, so let's descend now down to 2,000 feet and let's do that in thrust idle open descent. Uh, sorry, no, let's do 3,000 feet. 3,000 feet open descent and we are flap one. Good. So, what we can also do is go and run our approach checklist. That's something we need to do. That happens about now. Um, or maybe it should actually happen a bit earlier. So documents, normal checklist, approach. ECAM status is checked. I'm checking to see there's no STS message here. Nothing unusual in the ECAM. So that's checked. Approach type and runway. I look at my navigation display and check the type and runway. So ILS and 27 left. That's what we wanted to do. Minima, we have on here, MDA 277. Approach phase, active. So that's the perf page. You shouldn't see anything here. It should be blank like this. That means the approach phase is active. Otherwise, activate it now. Below that, once we're cleared to an altitude barrow ref, we've got QNH1, 008, set and set. Great stuff. Right, I'm just going to pause the sim once more. So the sim is now paused. Let's talk about getting onto the ILS. To fly an ILS approach, going back to our charts, you need to start off below the glide slope. So the ILS is a big topic and I will do a video on it in the future. Um, and I have done videos already on the channel to explain what it's doing for us. So this is going to be a very, very brief guide. The ILS stands for Instrument Landing System. It covers two axes. It gives us lateral guidance, so called the localizer, which tells us if we're left or right of the runway center line. And it gives us vertical guidance called the glide slope, which tells us if we're high or low. So to fly an ILS approach, what we're going to do, this is a top down view of London. Here's the left runway we're landing on. This is the extended center line, we call it. It's a, if you imagine drawing a line out from the center line, that's what we're going to intercept. We want to fly along that line to line up with the runway. Same for the glide slope. It is, this is a side on view. Here's the runway, and this is what the glide slope looks like pointing out into the distance. It's three degree angle above the ground. So three degrees, we're going to intercept that, fly down it, uh, and uh, that will guide us to the runway at three degrees, which is normal for an ILS approach. So we need to intercept it. We don't want to be above it when we do that. So I'm going to descend to be slightly below it and then join it. As you can see here, it, as the further out we are, the higher it is. So typically at 3,000 feet is about nine miles away from the runway. Please remember that's based on the airport's elevation. So you need to check how high up the airfield is. So London Heathrow, runway elevation, it's three hectopascals. It's nothing. It's very low. Um, so all I have to do here, look here, runway, uh, runway is 77 feet, touchdown zone 56 feet above sea level. So all I need to do is add that. I mean, today they're basically the same, but let's say this was 1,000, it was 1,000 feet above sea level. In that case, 3,000 feet above the runway would actually be 4,000 feet on the altitude. But a lot of airports in Europe in particular uh, are closer to sea level. Although there are those that aren't. So anyway, keep that in mind. 3,000 feet above the runway, not above sea level, above the runway is about nine miles on a three degree glide slope. So if I get myself down to 3,000 feet above the runway, which today is actually 3,000 feet on my altimeter, and I get myself out to, uh, let's say 12 miles, then I'll be below the glide slope. I want to be below it because it will then come down from above and I can intercept it and carry on down the glide slope. How will I know? Well, I've got this diamonds showing up now. So what these are telling me is the glide slope is above me and the localizer is to my left, which makes sense. I can see ILL over here and the frequency, which tells me the Airbus has identified it. So I don't need to listen for it. It's identified. So the correct ILS is showing up. ILL, uh, which is the same ident as we have here. It's actually this Morse code digits underneath if you wanted to listen for it. So I'm below the glide slope. I'm at 3000 feet. 
I can then get myself out. I want to intercept and be on the center line by about, I could do about 10 miles, but I'm going to aim for a bit more, about 12 miles. And that way it will join the localizer and then we'll join the glide slope as it comes down and you'll see this diamond move down. It will reach us and then carry on down with us. So that's how we're going to fly the ILS. So it's easier to show you. So let's release the simulator. I'm then going to get a bit closer and then turn around and intercept. You want about a 30 degree cut on the intercept. So if I, I'll show you what that means in a second. So just turning south now. And leave it in manage speed. Okay, they're about two miles out. Got a bit of a tailwind on this direction. So I'm going to turn it to intercept. So it's runway 27. So if I turn the heading to intercept at around about to four zero degrees there you go so we're turning now and what i need to do is now i'm pointing towards the airfield i'm going to press approach appr you could also just press localizer and then later push approach but i'm just going to do the full thing now as you can see we get glide slope blue and lock blue these are armed modes glide slope localizer so the localizer will now activate when this localizer diamond over here which tells us the center line which we can see on our screen is off to our left here it comes and this will work as well if you flew this whole thing in nav mode. And then we get lock star. It is capturing that localizer, turning towards it to point down the runway. Great news. Next, we are at 13 miles, 3,000 feet. So around about 9 miles, I expect this diamond to reach me and then the airplane to go glide slope star and fly down the glide slope. So that is going to come up very soon. So it's all working out nicely for us. By the way, when you arm the approach push button, you can also engage the second autopilot at the same time by pressing AP2 and you'll get this message, Cat3 Dual AP1 Plus 2. This is more to do with auto lands and low visibility. So uh, if you only have one autopilot, which is fine, then you'll see Cat3 single AP1. Uh, you could also fly with just AP2, of course, like this, and you'll see the same thing, Cat3 single AP2. So I'm going to have both autopilots, Cat3 Dual AP1 Plus 2. Here comes a glide slope. And this is our distance measuring equipment, by the way. This tells us how far we are from the runway, 11 miles. Remember, we also typed it into the progress page, uh, currently 10 miles. There's a slight bug going on with this at the moment. I'm not entirely sure what's causing it. Um, something to do with the ILSs. So here we go, 3,000 feet, glide slope star, and now the airplane's going down. So I think this DME reading is slightly wrong, and this is something that's going on with the simulator right now. Uh, and then we can see the runway in front of us. We've lined up correctly with it. Happy days. Once you're moving down the glide slope, oh, and let me pause here. Let, let me just talk, so we're no longer moving. Let me talk about uh, speed and configuration. So what I want to give you is some basic numbers. When you're about 15 miles from touchdown, and you can see that on the flight plan page, distance to go, or you can judge it, or I know I'm about 10 miles from here, or nine miles, we're a bit closer than this um, suggests. At about 15 miles, you need to be below 250 knots and slowing down. That would be the fastest you'd want to be. And you can just count down from there. So 14 miles, 240 knots. 13 miles, 230 knots. 12 miles, 220 knots. And so on. And that will work all the way down to your configuration. So I'm currently about 9 miles from touchdown. And I'm at 180 knots. So that's, I, I according to my logic, I could be at 190 knots. Uh, by 6 miles, I want to be no faster than 160 knots. This is not a rule. You can change this in the real world. We do fly different speeds. This is just a rough idea. If you're above those speeds, you are probably a bit fast and you need to do something to slow down so of course to get below some of these speeds like for me to get below 180 now i'm going to have to put out flap two so uh, that's going to be my next step uh, and i'm going to leave it in managed speed and the airplane can just carry on decelerating if you are fast we can of course use the speed brakes the speed brakes i haven't talked about all video but you could have used them at any point in the arrival if you were high or, or you wanted to slow down the airplane uh, with the autopilot engaged they will work up to half uh, but that's a whole video so you can just deploy them yourself so let me release the sim break so let's go to sims mail moving let's go to flap two remember we're below the equal sign now the flap at the back of the wing will come out uh, and this is where we get a bit of drag and the airplane should start decelerating as well once we're on the glide slope so we have glide slope start i can set the go around altitude which you'll remember from earlier it's 2,000 feet in the window and it's just sitting there good so Aircraft is decelerating. We have the option to use speed brake. If I put them out, they'll deploy on the wings and they will help slow down the aircraft, which we could have done at any point on this approach up until now. Once you go beyond flap three, you can no longer do that. So that's worked out. We're now 150 knots at eight miles. We're plenty slow enough, so I don't need to um, concern myself with slowing down the aircraft anymore. Next step is when do we put the gear out? So the configuration order is flap one, flap two, then gear down, then flap three and flap four. 
I recommend putting the gear down between 5 and 6 miles when you're new. Again, we do this later in the real world in certain conditions and at busier airports. But uh, 5 and 6 miles is a good place to do it. Again, watch out. This DME is wrong at the moment in the simulator. Uh, we're actually 6 miles away from landing, which makes more sense given our altitude of 2,000 feet. So I'm going to put the gear down now. When we do, we lower the gear. As soon as you've done that, you arm the ground spoilers by lifting this up. And we turn on the nose gear lights. So nose light goes to taxi only, runway turn off to on. You'll see now over here, landing gear will be in red, and then it will go to three green triangles. There they are, the gear is now down. Great. Then I can go to flap three and flap four. Checking the speeds. You can configure the flaps whilst the gear travels. There's no problem doing that uh, in unusual situations, but you can put flap three out before the gear and uh, so on. But I recommend um, keeping it simple. So I've given you some distances there and the order to configure flap one, flap two, gear down, flap three, flap four. Uh, and certainly by around five miles, I'd say put the gear out, flaps three, flaps four. Right, so looking on the PFD, we can see the ILS is being followed correctly because the diamonds are in the middle. So this is our localizer telling us we are in the correct place. If this was on the right, then it means we are left and we need to fly to the right. Uh, likewise with the glide slope, if it was above us, it means we are low. So we need to fly not up, but perhaps level off or shallow our descent to recapture it. We're going to run the landing checklist, of course. So let's do that. Very straightforward in the Airbus. Landing checklist auto brake is set to low. And we can see auto brake low down here. Uh, missed approach altitude, 2,000 feet is set, and the ECAM memo landing, no blue, so we want to see no blue messages on here, um, which it will until you get the landing configuration up and uh, the signs and so on. That is it. We are now stabilized and ready to land off of our ILS. Okay, so you guessed it. We're going to have to pause again to talk about the landing briefly. So landing the Airbus is uh, quite straightforward. There is a technique, and I'll be doing videos on it in the future. But here's what we're going to do today. We're landing from an ILS, so at some point... Uh, any point from now you could have disengaged it earlier we're going to disconnect the autopilot that's done using this red button the bind for this button is autopilot off in Microsoft Flight Simulator and it's important you have the correct one set otherwise uh, you may have autopilot disconnect which will involve it will simulate you that you're pressing one of these buttons which will be wrong uh, and it will actually give you the wrong sort of warnings so in the real Airbus you if you press this red button you'll get the autopilot off chime you'll get three chimes and it will say it for a second and then it will stop you only need to press it once uh, and that will work correctly in the Phoenix as long as you're using the correct bind of autopilot off. Good. So we're going to press that at any point now. And then we can keep following the flight directors all the way down to, um, well, to a sensible height. But we're visual, so we're going to start looking out the window soon. But you can keep following the flight directors in the meantime. And they will keep you on the localizer and glide slope because those are the active modes at the top of the PFD. Good. So that's what we're going to do. And we'll carry on flying with this. So how do we land the Airbus? Well, it's quite straightforward, as I said. The Airbus is going to start counting down radio altimeter altitudes uh, and it's going to say 500 soon enough. We're currently at 810. This is our radio altimeter showing on the PFD, this number down here. It's going to, that is a pinging a signal directly to the ground beneath you. So that's not an altitude above sea level, that is a height above the ground where you actually are. It's a very accurate uh, number compared to the altimeter. So what we're going to do is we're going to hear uh, the number probably 100. And then we'll hear 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, uh, maybe 5. So those are heights above the ground. So around about as you cross the threshold, you'll hear 50. You may or may not hear 40. It will depend on your settings. Um, so some of these are airline specific. So if we go to SIM settings and then you go to airline modifiable, uh, sorry, not airline modifiable, it's in RADAP call out so you can actually see. So I've got 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, and 5 all enabled. The airlines have different policies on that. Anyway, the key one is going to be about the 30. So you'll hear 50, 40. At 30, and by this point, we'll be looking out, looking out towards the end of the runway. When you hear 30, that's a good time to start the flare. The flare is a maneuver where we raise the nose a couple of degrees just to reduce the rate of descent for landing. That's all it is. The best way to judge it is looking out of the window. It's a bit of a, a nose up. The Airbus is going to do lots of things in the meantime. It will change to what's called a flare law. We're currently in normal law. It's going to freeze the trimmer. It's going to put a slight nose down input. Don't worry about any of that that's all there to make it feel natural to you as a pilot so you're going to look out to the end of the runway when you hear 30 raise the nose just a little bit uh, there's no specific number just enough to reduce the rate of descent then at some point after that and before the main wheels touch down you're going to idle the thrust levers remember they're still in climb because in climb mode we have the auto thrust engaged um, as we have over here uh, and speed so 
if we leave them in climb and we try and land the airplane, it will actually start to accelerate the engines to maintain the speed. And if we touch down with them in climb, it will actually spool all the way out to climb thrust. So we don't want that to happen. So at some point after 30, after you've started the flare, but before you touch the wheels down, you're going to idle the thrust levers to zero. That way the auto thrust will disconnect and it will stop trying to maintain the speed and it will idle the engines for landing and it will keep them at idle after you touch down. Good. So that will be probably around 20, maybe 10 feet. Um, you can adjust that depending on the situation. So in normal conditions, probably somewhere between 10 and 20 feet. Um, but if the airplane has too much energy, you might do it a bit higher, closer to 30 feet. If the airplane is low on energy or you're sinking a bit fast, then maybe you'll leave it on a bit longer, maybe to five feet. Who knows? It's an adaptable thing. They just must be at, at zero by touchdown. That's the, the only rule there. Idling it straight away at 30 feet uh, is um, something you could do if you've got a lot of excess energy but what you don't want to do and what is the incorrect technique is to idle the thrust levers and then flare the aircraft that is a mistake that uh, some people will fall into so make sure you start the flare about about 30 feet and then idle after that before touchdown now that flare point of 30 feet will also depend on the conditions. If you're sinking really fast, you might need to start it earlier, maybe 40 feet, maybe even closer to 50. If you're finding that the airplane's got a lot of extra energy uh, and you're running a bit, um, a bit, it's starting to float along the runway, then you might not flare until a bit later, maybe 20 feet. But you will learn to adapt to that as you get used to the aircraft. So these are not exact rules, but the thing that I must stress is that these must be at idle by touchdown uh, and you don't want to idle them before you start the flare or you'll find that you run out of energy. We leave them on a little bit longer just to make sure we have uh, some thrust available to us if we need it. The Airbus will say retard at 20 feet rad out on a manual landing. That is just a reminder. All it's doing is telling us that we need to close these by touchdown. It's such an important thing, Airbus built in that oral reminder. So if you don't idle them, it's going to keep saying retard, 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 which is saying please retard, which means um, return the thrust, it will remove uh, the thrust levers back to zero. So it's going to keep saying that until you do don't worry if you need to leave them there because you've you're getting a lot of sync rate then that's something you just have to do and the warning is just there to remind you to close them by touchdown it's just a reminder they must are very clear on that in a manual landing what happens once we touch down well in fact just before we touch down if there's a crosswind you're going to remove that crosswind in the last few feet uh, but i will talk about that in a future crosswind video that's a big topic but yeah make sure you're pointing down the runway so flare idle the thrust levers and before touchdown you're going to just squeeze a little bit of rudder in the direction you need to point it down but uh, don't worry too much about that now so once the main gear touches down the ground spoilers will deploy because we've armed them so as soon as the main gear touches down we can move the reversers to idle reverse remember we're using idle reverse so that means from zero where they'll be for the landing you can just lift up the levers and put it to reverse idle you could go to max initially and then back to reverse idle if you choose it's, it's your option or you could just go to max reverse if you're not sure don't worry too much you can do that as soon as the main wheels touch down. That is the way it works on the Airbus. And then you're going to gently lower the nose of the aircraft to the runway. We don't ever push forward on the side stick to do this unless there's something strange going on. Uh, so generally you just release a bit of the back pressure that you've been holding in the flare. You release that pressure uh, and let the nose gently settle onto the runway. Don't hold it up. We don't hold it up. We don't allow the aircraft to decelerate with the nose in the air. We don't want to do any of that. We just gently lower it to the runway promptly. Uh, as soon as the main gear touches down but without pushing forward or anything silly like that and then the auto brake will engage when the auto brake engages you'll get a decel light on here when it reaches uh, a certain threshold and you'll see of course a trend arrow down in the real aircraft this is where pilot monitoring would say spoilers to check these have come up then they'd say reverse green because you'll see reverse on the engine display and they'd say decel which means the aircraft is decelerating satisfactorily okay right sounds simple enough let's give it a go Okay, are you ready then? So releasing the simulator now. Remember all the automatics are in. You're going to want your feet up on your rudder pedals at this point if you're using them. We get the landing inhibit message, which means the ECAM is not going to give us random warnings now. It's going to save only special warnings it thinks are going to be an issue for the landing. Very clever system the Airbus has. So here comes the autopilot off. So I press the red button. You'll hear the clicks. We see the autopilot off message. I pressed it once and then it reverts. That triple click is the airplane saying, oh, I can't auto land, so I've downgraded to cat one. It's just telling us there's been a downgrade. So we can keep following the flight directors now if we want, but it's time to start looking out. As you get visual, it's a good idea to keep your eyes towards the end of the runway. So I can see I'm getting a bit low. Got the pappies. If they're three reds, you're a bit low. If it's four reds, you're very low. If it's three whites, you're a bit high. If it's four whites, you're very high. That's these lights over here. Two whites, two reds means we're on profile, as you know. 
Now the glide slope may disappear off, that's a bug with the sim at the moment, but I'm going to keep flying down with those pappies towards the runway. Something sensible, keeping that vertical speed about 800 feet per minute, 700 feet per minute, whatever it was when you were flying down the ILS fully configured. Here we come then, looking out down the runway. 30, 40, 30, 30 flare, 20, idle, holding the nose there, five, that's all we need. There's touchdown, deploying the reversers, using the rudder to keep it straight, gently lowering the nose. Oh, bit wobbly on the rudder there. So now, as we said earlier, we have spoilers, reverse green, and the airplane is decelerating. You can see the decel green light has come on on the low auto brake message. And that is us on the ground. So it's very straightforward. You flare, you idle, and you just let it settle. It's just a small pitch change to reduce the rate of descent for the landing. Now the, the auto brakes will bring the aircraft to a stop unless you manually take over by pressing the tow brakes, which deselects it. But if you're using the Thrustmaster TCA, you also need to turn the dial to off or disarm otherwise it will uh, re-engage straight away and there we are welcome to London Heathrow So there we are, that was an entire uh, approach preparation, descent, ILS approach and landing in the Phoenix Simulations A320. Hopefully this has helped you if you've been wondering about a few of these things and how to get the aircraft done and to those of you who are used to flying the Airbus in the sim, hopefully it's given you a bit of uh, extra context or information on, on some of the things we do with the real aircraft. As I said earlier, there's lots and lots of things here um, to go through and these are big, big, big topics where I could produce easily a, a one hour video on a lot of different things that we've covered today. So there'll be more videos to come in the future and guides on the more advanced things as well as non-precision approaches. So do please subscribe if you'd like to see more of these videos. There'll also be live streams coming where I talk about these things and we fly different approaches around the world as well as fly other different airliners uh, and I can answer your questions. So do please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos or live streams. Otherwise, we'll see you again in an another of those videos or streams soon. Thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.